the, the title of the session is about oxygen therapy. Uh, my name is Sonia Danoff. I'm a pulmonologist at Johns Hopkins and a med member of the Medical Advisory Board for the Myositis Association. And it's a tremendous pleasure to be here today. I'm joined today by, uh, by, my, uh, by Annalise Clipso, who is the nurse practitioner for the ILD program at Hopkins and who has a tremendous knowledge about um, oxygen use, um, oxygen prescription, and she's going to share some of her experience with you. I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about lung disease in myositis, just to set the stage for why we would be interested in talking about oxygen therapy. So I'll ask Annelise if she can share her screen. And you all should feel really uh, comfortable um, putting questions in the Q&A or chat area. And we'll try to answer them um, as we go along if we can, and if not, we'll certainly try to answer as many as we can at the end of the session. So welcome, and I hope you enjoy what we have to say today. Great. So the title of the um, session today is Oxygen Therapy, the Role of Oxygen in the Treatment of Interstitial Lung Disease. And what I really would like to do in the next couple of minutes to sort of set the stage for what Annelise is going to talk about is to kind of help remind you about what the lung is supposed to do normally. And um, by describing that, then I think we'll be in a good position to understand what this um, entity called interstitial lung disease and how that fits into um, the disease of autoimmune myositis. We're, I'm then going to turn it over to um, Annelise and she'll talk about oxygen and she, one of the very important things she's going to cover is how to travel with oxygen which is from a practical standpoint is something that a lot of people are very interested in. So next slide please. So let's start off just by reminding you about what makes up the lung. So the lung is actually a fairly simple organ. It's composed of airways, which are essentially the tubes that connect the lung to the mouth. And those, um, those tubes have names like the trachea and the bronchi. But basically what they're doing is they're just um, acting as the passageway to get oxygen, to get air from the outside world to the a business part of the lungs, which is out in the periphery of the lungs. Another very important component of the lung is, is the blood vessels, because the blood vessels actually allow the red blood cells, which carry oxygen, to get in close uh, relationship to the air itself. And then the air is contained in these structures that are called alveoli or air sacs. Next slide, please. And what you can see in this diagram is that air essentially comes in through the mouth, goes down through the trachea, and out through the airways to get into these spaces called the air sacs or alveoli. When the air comes down, it's a mixture of gases, and that includes oxygen. The oxygen is at about 21% of the air in the, in the outside world. And what the, um, this a uh, very important structure the alveoli do, uh, alveolus does is it brings the air in close um, proximity to the blood vessels. You can see that in the diagram at the bottom. And what happens is that oxygen then can float across the membrane and bind to the red blood cells. They contain a compound called hemoglobin, and hemoglobin is what binds the oxygen. At the same time, carbon dioxide, which is the waste product after oxygen is burned in the cells to create fuel for our muscles and all of our organs, carbon dioxide actually also just floats across the membrane and is, is removed when you breathe out or exhale. Next slide, please. So why do people who have myositis get interstitial lung disease? And so Myo is really um, a term that means muscle, and situs means inflammation. So a lot of people ask me, well, why, do, why would somebody who has a muscle disease get something that's part of, that involves the lung? And so the question is sometimes is, does the lung have muscles? And the answer is yes, it actually does have, have muscles. It has muscles of breathing, um, including the diaphragm, which is the large muscle that helps with 
uh, breathing in and breathing out. And also there are intercostal muscles, which are the muscles that are between the ribs. And they also help in certain circumstances when you take a breath. But the myositis actually affects the lung itself. And so the name myositis is a little bit of a, it's a little bit misleading because the inflammation can actually also damage the lung. And that can happen even though the lung is not a muscle. Next slide, please. So what happens when you develop this process of interstitial lung disease? Well, the immune cells that are in your body to defend you against infection and um, foreign bodies make a mistake and they see some part of you as being abnormal or dangerous, even though it's really not. This is truly an error of the immune system. And when that happens that the, the target is the lung, then it creates what we call inflammation in the lung. And inflammation is different from infection because an infection occurs when the immune system enters the lung to deal with a bacteria or a virus. But in this situation, the immune system enters the lung to attack what it perceives as being abnormal, but that's just part of your lung that it's damaging. And that's why we call it inflammation. And if inflammation sticks around too long, it can actually cause permanent damage to the lung. Scarring or fibrosis is another name for it. And, and those changes to the lung damage the very important space that we call the alveolar capillary interface, the place where that air and the blood vessels come close together. Next slide, please. So, so what happens when somebody develops interstitial lung disease? So you can see in the upper uh, diagram that the blood vessels really are all around the air spaces and they're very close to the air spaces. And what happens when there's inflammation or fibrosis is that the space between the blood vessels and the air spaces becomes enlarged. It gets filled up with either um, immune cells or with uh, collagen, which is what makes up fi the fibrosis or scarring. And when that happens, the process of transferring oxygen from inside that airspace to the blood vessel and then from the blood vessels out to your tissue, that becomes damaged or as less efficient. And so it's harder to get oxygen from the air that you're breathing in. Next slide, please. So what happens when somebody gets interstitial lung disease? Well, the reality is every person is very different. And so some of the symptoms that we commonly are told is that people get short of breath, and that's particularly when they're active. And so a flight of stairs, which might have been something that was easy to deal with before, could now be something that really seems like quite a, a hurdle because walking up the stairs makes you very out of breath. Many people develop a cough, even if they're not short of breath. And this is a very peculiar cough that seems to be mostly a problem during the daytime. It can be triggered by very minimal things like a little whiff of cold air or drinking something cold or walking past somebody who is wearing some perfume, or it can be a cough that's brought on just by walking around. And then the last thing is a lot of people just feel tired. They don't really have the kind of, I feel short of breath when I move around, but I just don't feel like I have as much energy. And, and that's obviously uh, can be a symptom of a lot of different things. So one of the problems is that sometimes the early symptoms of interstitial lung disease are very hard to pin down because they can uh, be symptoms that occur with other, other problems. And so what are the findings? Like when you go to see your doctor, what are the symptoms that they would be, what are the signs they would be looking for? Next slide, please. Well, when they listen to you, they put the stethoscope on your chest. The thing that they're listening for is this Velcro-like crackles. And so what is that sound? That's the sound that if you take a piece of Velcro and you, you pull it apart, you hear kind of a crackly noise. And that's the sound that the lung makes when there are areas of it that have become stiff from the fibrosis. When you take a breath in, those stiff areas all pop open at once and they make a sound that we call a crackle. 
You can also be diagnosed through a chest x-ray or a CT scan, and I'm sure many people have had those tests done if they've been diagnosed, and sometimes we do that just to screen, that is to make sure that it's not there even in somebody who might not have symptoms. And I'll show you a couple of pictures of some of these different types of tests in a minute. The other thing that many people are aware of is something called pulmonary function testing. This is not typically people's favorite things to do when they come to see the, the doctor. It's a very exertional uh, test that measures in a very specific way, both the size of the lungs and also how they work in terms of absorbing oxygen. And a few people, but hopefully very rarely, will have what's called a biopsy. And that is where a piece of the lung is actually taken out either surgically or through a bronchoscope because uh, it, there somebody wants to look at it under a microscope. Fortunately, that's not something that's typically needed. Next slide, please. So I talked about CT scans. Many of you have had CT scans, and I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of what people are looking for when they look at a CT scan. So the one on the left is a normal lung, and what you can see, this is done right at about mid-chest level, and what you can see is that there's a big area of black with little white flecks in it, and that's the lung, and that's normal because the lung is filled with air, and when you have a CT scan, you're using radiation to take, a pic, to take a look at what's inside the chest. And air doesn't reflect X-ray beams, so it appears black. So if you look in the center of that image on the left of the screen, you'll see that there's sort of a black lobe. And, and that's, actually, um, that's actually the trachea, the tube that goes from the mouth to the lungs. And the lungs themselves are black, but they have little white flecks in them, and that's the supporting tissue of the lung, what is called the interstitium. Now, if you look at the image on the right where you see the picture of interstitial lung disease, what you can see quite clearly is that the lung, rather than being purely black, has these areas of kind of white or gray, and that appearance is the appearance that we call ground glass. Now, ground glass is not really glass. It's just a description of what we think of when we look at that, and it looks like a ground glass stopper. Some of you may never have seen a ground glass stopper. They used to be used on, um, on jars to keep the jars from opening, uh, from le leaking air. Now, that ground glass is probably the best way that we can understand inflammation in the lung. So that ground glass is a kind of a marker of inflammation in the lung. But I have to tell you, the ground glass is actually not specific to inflammation. So sometimes we see it in a situation where somebody has an infection, and sometimes we see it where somebody has inflammation. Um, and a lot of what you'll work on, work with uh, your doctor about, is trying to figure out, is it inflammation or is it infection? Next slide, please. Okay, pulmonary function testing. This is um, one of the best ways we have of measuring the, the capacity of the lung, both its size as well as its function and ability to absorb oxygen. And there's a lot of different numbers when you look at this um, display. I hope each of you who has pulmonary function tests has had an opportunity to look at this with your doctor. And I just wanna point out that there are really kind of three numbers that I'd like you to keep an eye on um, for yourself. The first is this FVC, force vital capacity. That's how big a breath you can blow out when you take a big deep breath and blow out hard. The second is TLC or total lung capacity. And that's if you're breathing very slowly, how big is the largest breath, that how much is the largest amount of air you can put in your chest. And then the last one is this DLCO, and that's a measure of, that's the diffusion capacity. It's a measure of how well you absorb oxygen from the air. Now, if you look along the top, you'll see that there are a couple of columns. One says PRED for predicted. That's determined by your age, your height, and your gender. And that's based on lots and lots of people who were non-smokers who had these measurements done to establish what the norms are. The next one is actual. That's what you actually did. And then you'll see a percent of predicted. And the percent of predicted is very helpful because 
for a person who is my height, 5'4", um, uh, a two and a half liter volume might be very good, but if you were maybe six foot three, that would be fairly small. So these have to be normalized to your height and your gender. And so the percent predicted really compares you to the people who you should be most similar to. And we say that normal, because people are all a little different, normal is anything that's greater than or equal to 80% predicted. And so in this situation, the FVC at 80% of predicted is normal. However, if you look down at the diffusing capacity in the column to the right, you'll see that that number is only 71% of predicted, and that would be considered abnormal, it'd be slightly small. So if you look at these numbers over time, it gives you a really good idea of what's happening to the lung. So what um, inflammation and scarring in the lung tend to do is they tend to make the lung stiff, which makes it smaller, and they tend to make the diffusion less efficient, so it makes the DLCO go down. So again, if you follow these over time with your doctor, you'll have a good understanding of whether your disease is stable, getting better, or possibly getting worse. And those are very important things to think about because that will influence what kind of medications you might get. Next slide, please. Okay, so why is it important to actually find out if somebody has interstitial lung disease? Well, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to differentiate if you're short of breath or if you're weak, because both of them can make it harder to do what you wanna do in terms of activity. And the other thing that's very um, kind of sneaky about interstitial lung disease is that it can get worse even when your skin and muscle disease are better. And so it really functions independently of some of the other signs and symptoms of, of autoimmune my, myopathies or myositis. And sometimes we talk with our colleagues in rheumatology about how we should treat these diseases. And if there's interstitial lung disease, then the treatment decisions really have to be, treat, have to be driven by the lung disease because this can be a life-threatening and a very life-limiting um, feature of autoimmune myositis. And so recognizing that the um, interstitial lung disease is there, treating it aggressively, um, and, and following uh, lung function carefully are very important for best outcome in autoimmune myositis with interstitial lung disease. Next slide, please. Okay, so what could this mean for, for your life? Well, you know, everybody is different and some people develop interstitial lung disease and they have virtually no symptoms and when they're treated for their myositis, the interstitial lung disease is, is essentially not a problem. Um, the immunosuppressive medications, the ones that are used for myositis, often help the lung disease. So the good news is that many people never notice they have interstitial lung disease because the medicines they're getting for their muscle and and joint disease are actually, and skin disease are actually treating it. However, sometimes we need to use medicine specifically to treat it if the interstitial lung disease is more difficult. Oxygen is often used as a, um, an adjunct, sort of like wearing glasses I think of, where I can wear my glasses so I can see my slides better. And if you use oxygen when it's needed, it will help you uh, live your life more fully, be able to exercise more and be more comfortable. And then finally, pulmonary rehabilitation, which some people may have experienced, where they go to a center where they're monitored for their oxygen and heart rate, and they have a period of maybe eight or 12 weeks where they go a couple times a week, and each time they're asked to exercise more vigorously. So it's a process to help you regain your strength and also to do it in a way that's safe and builds confidence. Next slide, please. And now I'm going to turn it over to Annelise, who's going to really focus on the major topic of, of this session, which is oxygen use. So Annelise, take it away. Um, so for this second half of the presentation, as Sonia discussed, we're going to be discussing oxygen and the various methods in which it can be utilized in, in an individual. Um, but first, as um, Sonia had discussed, we are going to talk about the symptoms of ILD which, and how they can compromise the quality of life. So 
generally speaking, we patients can have shortness of breath, fatigue, cough, and low oxygen levels. Um, while research is being done to improve the quality of life, our goal is to help you do everything we can to improve the, qu the quality, sorry, improve the quantity of your life. Um, our goal is to improve the quality of your life. Okay, so oxygen therapy, what does it consist of? So oxygen is a colorless, odorless, and tasteless gas that is required in order for our bodies to function. And oxygen therapy is the administration of that gas at a concentration that is greater than what is normally found in our environment. So generally speaking, there's about 21% of oxygen in the air that we breathe normally. It is lower at higher altitudes. Sorry, let me just touch base on this again. Um, so patients at times when their oxygen saturations, if they, are, if they are exhibiting signs and symptoms of shortness of breath, it can be concerning and it is a difficult topic to, to initiate from a patient standpoint. It's easy to say you're short of breath, but it's hard to state that oxygen is something that you need. So again, the physical manifestations of oxygen need. Patients can be short of breath, they can have muscle fatigue, rapid heart rate with minimal exertion. So you can be doing something that you did normally about a week or two ago, as in bringing your groceries. And now taking your groceries from your vehicle to your home, you can exhibit symptoms of where you feel as if you just hit a wall. So you, what you were able to do about a week or two ago is something that may or may not be as easy as it was before, such as groceries, walking up and down the stairs. Muscle, muscle fatigue is something that is common and a common, uh, a common complaint from patients with myositis. Um, other signs and symptoms that patients have brought up to me in clinic, especially their loved ones, is that or a significant other is that they're irritable or they're forgetful. Things that they normally would just pick up on or be sharp about, they're unable to answer those questions or it just takes them a little more time. But there's also a group of patients who don't have any symptoms of shortness of breath or fatigue at all, and they don't realize that they're not getting enough oxygen. So who needs supplemental oxygen? Um, in order to determine who requires supplemental oxygen, there's two ways to test. So there's an arterial blood gas in which blood is drawn from an artery in your wrist to measure the amount of oxygen in your blood. And if you fall below 55 millimeters of mercury, then you qualify for oxygen based on insurance measures. It's not um, a method that we do frequently. Um, most commonly what we do and in clinic is pulse oximetry. A probe is attached to your finger. Many of you have had this done if having your vital signs taken in a doctor's office and it ind indirectly measures the amount of oxygen in your bloodstream. So if your oxygen saturation for insurance purposes fall below 88 percent on room air then technically you qualify for oxygen. So to touch I'll uh, just touch base a little more on pulse oximetry. Um, in order to be tested in clinic, well, when tested in clinic, you're tested at rest, so your oxygen saturation without moving, then your oxygen saturation um, with exertion, so whether walking a couple laps in the office, and then at that time, your oxygen and heart rate levels are measured, and if you were to fall below 88%, technically you qualify. But I personally find that this test has some flaws because realistically speaking, anyone can walk for the most part on flat ground and not get short of breath. You control your pace, you control your movement. So it's really important that you discuss with your provider that I have stairs at home or I walk up an incline or I notice shortness of breath with an incline or I can do, you know, four or five miles walking in a mall when we were all going to the mall regularly. 
with no issue. But walking up my driveway or, you know, someplace I used, I was able to hike about a month ago, I can't do it. So in our clinic, what I tend to do is I ask patients if they have any stairs and we go upstairs. We, and two, three flights later, they're short of breath. I'm short of breath. Everyone is short of breath. And it really does give a true indication of how much oxygen a person needs. And that patient is able to, to replicate the exact feeling that they had at home. But walking five laps in the office, their oxygen saturation stays above 95%. So if you're having shortness of breath and, it's, and it is related to an incline or stairs in your home, ask your provider to see if possibly they can do, you know, a couple stairs in the office, if there are any, to determine what your oxygen saturation truly is. So just to touch base on the types of supplemental oxygen. We have home concentrators, portable concentrators, oxygen cylinders, and liquid oxygen. Now, they're all, they all serve their purpose. Um, they're delivered in very in different means. Um, Patients do have a preference as to what they like. I think everyone's impartial to one delivery method over another. And it, it really is a, a, a trial and error to determine which best fits your needs. Um, other uh, types of portable oxygen systems, they do come in continuous and pulse flow. Um, oxygen, liquid, and tanks. We're going to discuss a little more in depth on the various method, delivery methods. So home concentrators. Home concentrators are a stationary unit that go in your home. They, the advantages are that they deliver unlimited gas volume. They're cost effective. They're readily available by every single oxygen company in the U.S. and pretty much worldwide. The disadvantages are they're not portable, they're rather heavy, and they're electricity dependent. So that is something you need to alert your um, ele electrical company um, that you have oxygen, so that way if there is some sort of power outage, that you're one of the first people that get their um, home oxygen, their electricity um, up in order. So liquid oxygen. Um, liquid oxygen is uh, oxygen that's been compressed into a liquid. It's rather light. Um, it's portable. It's easy to refill if the refills, if the refill stations are readily available. The disadvantages are that they're expensive. They're prone to leaking and freezing, and that primarily is due to education and ability to uh, fill your tank. And it is now limited, it's limited in its availability nationwide. Oxygen um, cylinders, now this is just compressed gas in a tank. Um, they have high flow options. So going from 0.5 liters to up to 12, 15 liters, depending on the system. They're portable. They're readily available nationwide and a bit worldwide as well. They're heavy. Disadva disadvantages are that they're heavy. They do require frequent filling or um, distribution or delivery to your home. And they can make traveling uh, more difficult. Now the most popular of the four types are portable oxygen concentrators. I'm pretty sure that most people have seen a commercial for some sort of device. The advantages are that they're great for travel, they're battery operated, and they're rechargeable. But disadvantages are that they're limited in battery power. It only delivers pulse flow oxygen and it has liter flow limits. Also another um, disadvantage is that they can be cost prohibitive. So types of oxygen flow. So the two types um, that they have are continuous flow, which is the most common uh, uh, method of delivery. So even if you are not taking in a deep breath, oxygen will be delivered to you continuously 24 hours as long as that oxygen is available. Um, pulse dose, no, also known as demand flow, is delivered only when you take a deep breath, well, a breath in general. So you would have to inhale and oxygen would be delivered. 
uh, pulse flow and continuous flow are not the same. A setting of two liters continuous is not the same as two liters pulse. The difference in the liter flow can be as much as 50 to 70% depending on the device. So if you have two liters per minute flowing continuously, you are sure that it is two liters. But two liters per minute pulse dose oxygen, you may need to have your device go up to as much as four, five, or six, depending on the model, in order to get the same equivalent of the two liters per minute continuous. So the methods of delivery for um, oxygen can be via nasal cannula. Nasal cannula is a disposable plastic device with two um, prongs, and they go into your nostrils and it's connected to an oxygen source. The advantages of a nasal cannula are that you're able to eat, talk, there's no obstruction. Um, the disadvantages are that if you have any um, nasal obstruction, if you've had any, um, uh, I guess, surgeries, uh, I would say frequent uh, deviated septum, um, if you have chronic drying mucus, those can be uh, prohibitive in um, having a nasal cannula in your nose. And it would actually be, it could be painful or at least uncomfortable. Uh, they can be dislodged easily because they go behind the ears and, and due to that, they can also cause irritation. And if you're a mouth breather, it's not ideal. It, it, it's, it's easy to explain to someone how to take a deep breath. But if they're not comfortable with it, there really isn't anything that you can do. Like you can't convince someone to breathe through their nose if they're, if they're a mouth breather. Um, so in that case, a simple face mask would be an option. It delivers um, a higher percentage of oxygen and it can be used with increased oxygen delivery. Um, the disadvantages are a, a tight seal is required and you're unable to eat or drink without removal of the mask. But it is great for mouth breathers and especially also during exercise because patients and people in general tend to pant or are mouth breathers with certain types of exertion. So humidifiers. Humidifiers are, are um, they're actually, they're really great. They actually stop a lot of issues that people have when wearing oxygen. Uh, if you require four liters per minute or above, humidification is something that should come with your oxygen setup. It can help prevent your nasal membranes from drying out. It's distilled water. It's not tap water. So um, the setup is, it's rather easy. You just fill a container, you wash it out once empty with just some Dawn and reattach it to your um, home concentrator. So the benefits of supplemental oxygen. Um, as you can imagine, it will decrease shortness of breath, especially with exercise. It improves the ability to perform ADLs, your activities of daily living. It improves your overall level of fitness. You're able to do more, um, more active, especially if you're going to rehab, you might have an increased oxygen requirement than if you were at rest or just doing basic activities. We'll touch on that, on that later. Um, it can improve your quality of life. It increases your heart or your lifespan by decreasing the extra work on your heart um, because of uh, increase the extra work on your heart that your heart is doing because of low oxygen saturation. So the components of your oxygen prescription. So you've been tested, it's determined that you need oxygen. So pretty much at this point in time is when you would have a really frank discussion with your provider about your needs, your activity level, your thoughts and where you, what it is that you hope to be able to do with wearing oxygen. Um, your provider will determine whether you need uh, oxygen at sleep, rest, activities, or altitude, and how much is needed. But if you travel, it's, it's now, if, if traveling or, you know, a lot of time outdoors or just, you know, short excursions in general, this is when you have that conversation. So 
oxygen companies, patients can choose an oxygen company based on what their needs are. If someone tells me that their significant other or their child or their grandchild is on the West Coast and we're on the East Coast, then that would lead me to pick a, to pick an oxygen company that can provide the oxygen that they need should they travel. Um, some people, they are, they remain local. So I can provide a company that does not provide liquid, but I can choose gas or, or something portable. It really all depends, but it's harder to make those adjustments after you get your oxygen than it is before you get your oxygen. So your home setup, you get your oxygen order, you know oxygen is coming. Pretty much it should consist of a home concentrator, a portable, some sort of portable oxygen and a backup tank and nasal cannulas and humidification depending on your oxygen uh, level. The most important out of all of these is the backup tank. And the reason why is that if there is a blackout, if you know there is a malfunction in your home unit, that backup tank, which would be a, a, a large gas tank, would be there to provide you the oxygen that you need should you require it. Also during your home setup, it's really good to have someone else there with you during that initial setup. So that way the initial education that you receive is done at this time. So the initial, sorry, let me repeat that. So that the education that you and that other person receive is done at that time. And these are just some photos of um, technically what someone would possibly get. So home concentrator, uh, M6 tank, it's about the size of a wine bottle, is a form of portable oxygen and the portable oxygen concentrator. So here are some of the issues related to oxygen use. People can complain of dryness, runny nose, nosebleeds, but all of these symptoms can be alleviated based on, depending on how the nasal cannula is used, when the oxygen is used, and just also some simple tweaking or additions to your daily routine. So for dryness, I, you can do uh, nasal lubricants, AYR, saline gel, uh, normal saline. Um, if you're only wearing oxygen with exertion, during the times that you're not wearing oxygen, um, you can do uh, just simple moisture or um, not Vaseline, but there are other um, things that you can put in your nose, your nostrils, such as um, can ease or um, dry care. They're, um, they're all sold over the counter. For runny nose, it could be that your humidification, if you do have it on, could be running too high. And nosebleeds are a consequence of dryness. So with, and that can definitely be alleviated with a nasal lubricants. So things that you need to avoid with oxygen. So oxygen is a highly combustible gas. Granted, it doesn't burn, it can cause a fire. Therefore, it's important to avoid flames, sparks, any cigarettes, not that you would be smoking, but if anyone around you were to, um, matches, lighters, and gas stoves. You need to keep oxygen concentrators and tanks, especially, at least seven to 10 feet away from open flames. That includes bonfires, that includes stoves, you name it. Um, secure your oxygen tanks in your home, and if you're traveling with them, also in your vehicle, because it can become a projectile if they were to fall. So tips for um, traveling with oxygen in ILD patients. So do you need, a common question is, do you need oxygen to travel? If you use oxygen on a daily basis, you will need some sort of portable oxygen when you travel. Some patients may require portable oxygen when flying, even if they don't require it otherwise. And this can be determined by having a high altitude simulation test. So during the high altitude simulation test, patients, they breathe in 15.1% oxygen. Now, if you remember from a previous slide, 
In the air, we have 21%, so you're already starting at a lower concentration. And this simulates aircraft conditions. So this test determines patients who will experience low oxygen levels during air travel. And then once they determine how low your oxygen is, your oxygen levels titrated during, during the test to determine how much oxygen will be needed. Now, a really good example of this is if you're flying, once you reach a certain altitude, you notice that everyone on the flight is asleep. And the reason for that is because of the low oxygen concentration on the, in the cabin. But patients with ILD, what their main complaint is, is that once they reach a certain altitude, they're able to unbuckle their seatbelt. They're unable or they have difficulty walking to the bathroom or getting up to stretch their legs because they're short of breath. Now, if this test was done prior to, they would realize that they need oxygen during their flight. And sometimes it's just a mishap or it just, you know, it's just something that gets lost in translation. So it's not anyone's fault at all, but it is important that if you're going to be traveling, whether it's somewhere with high altitude or just flying long distance, that this test is done prior to your travel. Um, travel tips for ILD patients, so ground travel. So for ground travel, you can use portable tanks, you can use portable oxygen concentrators. Liquid oxygen isn't really recommended for ground travel unless you have refilling stations or if you're traveling less than 24 hours. Um, liquid oxygen is only viable in its portable form for 24 hours. If you're using tanks, identify tanks refill sites ahead of time. Your oxygen company can definitely help you with that. And also, by notifying your oxygen company prior to your travel, they can ensure that you have oxygen in place at your destination. For air travel, only FAA-approved um, portable oxygen, oxygen concentrators are allowed on the flight. And most oxygen providers will allow you to either rent one or provide you one, provide you one for travel. But also what I think a lot of people don't know is that some airlines actually do provide onboard oxygen rather than using a POC device, a portable oxygen concentrator, my apologies. So in order for this to be completed, that you would require a physician statement that verifies that the patient understands um, how to use their uh, portable oxygen concentrator. Also for air travel, you would require at least two times the flight worth of battery um, power. So if your flight is two hours, you would, you would be required to have at least two times that amount for your flight. Because if there's a malfunction or if they're unable to land, you need to be able to have um, enough uh, battery to uh, operate your POC device. So um, last slide on traveling with oxygen, <laughs> my apologies. Uh, plan, and this is the most important slide out of all of them. Planning ahead is really, 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 really important. Um, you need to plan well in advance um, before traveling to determine what type of oxygen you need, how the rental fees will be, whether or not we're able to set up oxygen at your destination. Because ultimately, my side is this, this is hard. The diagnosis of ILD, the diagnosis of myositis, but we don't, and we stress this with our patients, we do not want your life to be put on hold. And travel, if traveling is something that you wish to do, we will do whatever it is that we can in order to ensure that. And, you know, it's, it's part of your, you know, it's this entire um, process. There are different avenues and different aspects to it that all need some type of touch or care. And if traveling, socializing, the psychosocial dynamic, all of that is really important. So if this is just one piece that we can ensure, if you give us enough time, then yeah, you can go. Unless there's, you know, a medical reason for why you absolutely cannot. So after all of this oxygen talk, the main question is that I get is who pays for this? Um, 
if you have private insurance, it's covered by your um, insurance company. You have to just get do, you just have to do the pulse oximetry testing at least once a year. But if you have Medicare or Medicaid, um, it's, it's covered by Medicare or Medicaid Part B, and it's covered on a five-year cycle. So what this means is that once we submit your oxygen orders to um, a provider, the, Medicare will pay five years up front for your equipment and accessories. And during that five years, your supplier have, has to service, repair, and troubleshoot your device for the entire five-year cycle. But what they, they fail to tell patients is that Within the first year, you should obtain your portable oxygen concentrator, whatever home concentrator you wish, however nasal cannulas that you wish to get a month. Everything needs to be obtained up front because if you don't ask for it, they're not going to offer it to you. So if anything, I will say it's probably one of the joys that I have in prescribing oxygen because I ask for everything. I will ask for the moon that first go around just to make sure that um, everything that a patient would require would be obtained. So um, the goals of management um, with ILD and in regards to oxygen. So as Dr. Danoff uh, discussed, um, treatment, oxygen, um, mobility, and pulmonary re uh, rehab rehabilitation. These are the main components of um, interstitial lung disease, but as I had discussed before, um, quality of life is maintained by more than that. So we have, you know, your treatment, your basic activities of daily living, um, your psychological, your physical, your social, all of these play a major role in who you are and your disease process. And if, you know, oxygen is just a little bit of it that can, you know, allow you to have some resemblance of normalcy or at least have you um, participate in the activities that you want to do, then you know, I'm happy <laughs> to some extent. I'm happy that we're able to provide that for you, some sort of normalcy. So any questions? Thank you for your time. So thanks very much, Annalise. Um, I can tell you that Annalise sp spends an enormous amount of time handling oxygen prescriptions. And at Hopkins, she is fondly referred to as the, the queen of oxygen. So um, she knows lots and lots of the ins and outs. And I think that the advice she's given you is really good in terms of, you know, thinking about this, not just as what am I going to need today at this moment, but what is it I'm going to need over the long term? And I know we've had a couple of questions. I want to just try to um, answer a few of them if I can. Um, and so, so somebody said, how does one make an appointment with Anlis? <laughs> well, it, you know, we're very fortunate to be in an area where, um, you know, doctors are an important part of providing information and care, but the reality is that the care of um, patients with myositis is a group effort. And um, uh, we're lucky at Hopkins to have Anlis, and I suspect that there are probably Anlises in a couple of other of the myositis um, centers around the country. Um, but for sure, the Myositis Association, their website also offers a lot of information that can be very helpful. If you live in a place where you don't have as large a myositis center, you might want to take a look at their website to, to see some of the information that you know, we've discussed, but also additional resources for you. And um, again, I just want to um, emphasize a couple things that Annalise um, pointed out. You know, this is all about living your best life. And uh, certainly uh, nobody um, 
uh, expected or wanted to have the realities of myositis or interstitial lung disease as part of their life experience. But given that that's the kind of the hand that's been dealt, it's very important to think about how to make it the best life possible. And so, you know, for our patients, one of our biggest goals, whether it be in oxygen therapy or sending people to pulmonary rehab or else choosing uh, medications to treat their myositis or their interstitial lung disease, is to really optimize the quality, make it the best possible, and minimize the downsides. And that's often something that changes over time where, you know, perhaps uh, when you start out, if you have interstitial lung disease, you might need either more or less oxygen than you do in the future. So this is a conversation that you should have repeatedly with your providers. Um, and it's not something that it's sort of like a set and forget thing. It's much like, unfortunately, much like reading glasses. You know, the reading glasses that allow you to see the screen today may not be the reading glasses that work six months from now. And so it's very critical that you have an open conversation with your physician and your other providers at your uh, myositis uh, center. Um, and uh, one of the things we've talked about a little bit is pulse oxes. Um, I want to just um, talk a minute about that because you may have heard more about pulse oxes since, unfortunately, we entered this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about them. And essentially what the pulse ox does is it measures um, an oxygen level based on the fact that um, when oxygen is bound to hemoglobin, that thing I said that was in your red cells that helps carry the oxygen, the color is bright red. Whereas when hemoglobin is not bound to oxygen, um, it's actually more blue in color. And so it measures um, the ratio of the, of the amount of blue to the amount of red in the bloodstream using a light that shines typically through your fingertip, or if you have Raynaud's, they may use your ear or your forehead for the probe. And so that's um, sort of an indirect way of measuring it, but still it's a really easy way to do it. It doesn't involve taking any blood or anything of that sort. And we can also measure it continuously. So you can measure it when you're sitting still, and then you can go for a walk, or you can walk up a flight of stairs, as Anne Lise mentioned, and you can check what that number is. And what we're really aiming for is to keep that number typically above 88% with activity. Um, and the reason we have chosen that number is that when you start dropping much below 88% on that number, it starts to put a bit of strain on the heart. And, you know, again, part of the goal is to maximize all of your organ systems so they work to the best, um, in the best way possible. Now, other things can lower oxygen levels. And, um, you know, one of the things that sometimes people tell me about is that at night, um, that they may have low oxygen levels at night. And that sometimes means that there's an issue related to breathing while you're asleep. Um, one of those uh, issues can be something called obstructive sleep apnea, and that can sometimes cause people not to take such deep breaths when they're asleep at night and their oxygen level can go down. It can happen in children, it can happen in grown-ups, and really what it means is if that happens that you should go to see the doctor and just raise that issue with the doctor because it's something that's very easy to treat. And although we tend to think of our patients as having sort of one thing, you can have um, interstitial lung disease or myositis and have sleep apnea, and they need to be treated separately. So I think that if you were to have some concerns about that, that would be, you know, I would I raise that with the doctor and just let them know about that concern. Um, I wanted to also just talk very briefly um, about uh, the COVID-19 situation, since that's a, a little bit of the you know, the elephant in the room right now um, with, with all of our patients who have autoimmune disease. And, um, you know, what, what I think that we have been very pleased to see is that very few patients have um, developed uh, COVID-19. And I think that's because of the hard work that you and your families have been doing to stay safe, to uh, wear masks, to wash hands, to maintain social distance. Um, and I can only say that I, you know, I know this is incredibly difficult, uh, but it is something that is so important um, because, you know, we can't really predict um, 
what will happen when people have um, COVID-19. And so the best approach is to try to avoid getting it until uh, vaccines are available. And, and I know that that's a very difficult thing to do, um, but you know, we, as a community, we need to support each other in this period of time, which can be quite isolating uh, and make sure that, that people stay safe. And obviously, if you develop symptoms that you're concerned are related to COVID-19, specifically if you develop flu-like symptoms, um, uh, fevers, um, uh, shortness of breath that is beyond what you typically experience, then you need to reach out to your physician right away to see what should be done, how should you be tested, and so forth. Um, and this is unfortunately, I think, going to be a reality um, for probably the next, you know, six to 12 months, you know, even though we're discussing um, the fact that many companies are working very hard to uh, to develop vaccines, there are a lot of people in the world who are going to need to be vaccinated. And so it is very likely to be six to 12 months uh, before uh, these vaccines are widely available and before they can be made, uh, you know, everybody who needs them can can receive them. So we're, we're in this for the long haul, unfortunately. Um, I see that there was a question about um, ILD. Um, and the, the question is really sort of, when somebody develops ILD, does it happen all of a sudden or do the symptoms come on slowly? And the answer is it can be either. Um, we have some patients who have very dramatic presentations where they go from being quite well to being very short of breath over a matter of days to weeks. And we have other patients where it's a much more slow, subtle process that they might, over the course of weeks to months, notice that there are just things that they can't do as well as they used to. Part of it depends on when I, the ILD happens. Sometimes ILD is the presenting symptom, the first thing that happens when somebody develops autoimmune myositis. And in those cases, it's often very dramatic where somebody thinks they might have a pneumonia or something like that, but it doesn't get better after they get treated. And that's really the beginning of their autoimmune myositis. Other people have had myositis for a while and they maybe notice that a cough has started that they didn't used to have. And that can be, you know, that can be also the sign of myositis developing. So I wish I could give you a one answer that fits everything, but the reality is every human being is so different and every person's disease is really very different from each other. So we can make some generalizations, but each of you as you develop symptoms or have questions, you really need to raise these with your doctor um, individually to see what, what they think in the context of your own disease. I wanted to just stop and turn this back to um, Anneli's. Um, other thoughts, advice, you know, wisdom that you have that you wanna share with, um, with the folks who are joining us today? Um, I, I can say that the process in general is hard and, you know, in some form or fashion, patients have gotten bulldozed into myositis and ILD, but patients, I think it's going to take some time for things to normalize. And when I say normalize, I'm not talking about your disease, but getting adjusted to your new normal getting adjusted to oxygen if it's something that you require, um, testing, and just, you know, kind of developing yourself and walking through this new normal. And it takes, again, it takes time. I, I can't say it gets better. I can't say it doesn't get worse because everyone's different, but you guys are stronger than you think. And, and we've seen, you know, just in general, people just, once they kind of fall into their new normal, for the most part, that um, they're able to navigate this. And, you know, I, it's funny, I tell patients, it's like, I don't wanna wear oxygen. And I'm like, listen, if, you know, people, you know, I enjoy lipstick. So you go out, you get lipstick, it's like, hey, you know, this is, this is oxygen's the new sexy. Just, 
roll with it, you know? And, and it allows you to do what it is that you want to do. So just time and patience, I, I can definitely recommend. Yeah, and I think that Annalise just brought up a really important point. You know, going from having an illness where it may not be obvious to other people that something is wrong to having some kind of visible sign that there's something wrong is, is often really difficult. And wearing oxygen is sometimes that sign. It, it can be a really tough moment in people's disease when they suddenly have to kind of make it obvious that there's a there's a problem and i find this especially in in younger people and also in uh not to generalize but men find it a little bit more difficult to be seen with oxygen on than women do and and so i think that you know again it's it's a lot about what is important to you um and i always um feel and say that you know you need to decide what what matters does it matter more if you can go to watch your child or your grandchild play a soccer game and walk up to the stadium? Or does it matter more to you what somebody thinks about you because you have oxygen on? And so you have to prioritize. And for some people, honestly, you know, it's not, we're not shooting for perfection. We're shooting for good enough. So maybe there are some situations where you should be wearing oxygen, but it's such a burden or it's so difficult to have the oxygen that you're gonna make elect not to wear it in that situation. And you're gonna only use it where you absolutely have to. And that's also a reasonable decision. I mean, many of the decisions that you make about your own healthcare are gonna be compromises. What is the best for the moment? Um, you know, we do want you to wear oxygen if you need it and you're in a situation where you're exerting yourself because we wanna limit your the stress that is um, placed on your heart. We want to keep this to um, an illness that affects the lungs, not the heart. And we want you to be able to exercise as much as you can because that's good for your muscles as well as for your cardiovascular system and all the other things that you've been told about. Um, but sometimes there are going to be times where the practicality of having oxygen on may be very difficult. We often talk to our patients about, you know, back in the day when we would go to the restaurant to go eat, uh, you know, wearing your oxygen when you walked into the restaurant and then tucking your oxygen concentrator under the table and maybe sitting at dinner without the oxygen on because that made it more comfortable for them. And those are very reasonable things to think about. And again, what I would really encourage you is, is to have a conversation about, about this with your doctors because, you know, often when doctors um, make recommendations, they kind of do it in a very abstract way. You should wear oxygen, oxygen's good for you. But if you say to them, hey, well, this is the situation that I'm in, what would you, you know, how would you advise me? That they can then tailor that to a much more specific, um, a much more specific piece of information that, that is really much more relevant to you. Um, I see a, a question about benefit to wearing oxygen during sleep only. Um, so, Definitely, there are people who have uh, low oxygen levels at night. I was mentioning this um, something sometimes in the context of sleep apnea. And interestingly, for those people, it may either be better for them to have oxygen on or to wear a device that's called a CPAP mask, a continuous positive airway pressure. So what is um, sleep apnea? It basically is that when you're asleep, your brain is not controlling your muscles as, um, as aggressively. And so if you have a period of time where you're very deep in sleep, the muscles of, in the back of your throat can actually collapse and make it hard for the air to get in and out of that trachea. You remember how I pointed out that you use the trachea to get the air from your mouth down into the lungs? Well, the tissue around the trachea can actually collapse because your brain is not stimulating it. And then what you'll often see is firstly, people snore. And secondly, they'll have periods where the snoring actually stops and that's the word apnea, it means when you're not breathing. And so if you're found to have um, sleep apnea, you can actually use a mask that just blows a little bit of air down into your throat, and that helps keep the airway open even when you're deep asleep. And so you, that may be sufficient, you may not need oxygen. And conversely, 
oxygen may not do the trick if what's happening is that you're having this collapse in the airway. You may need the CPAP instead. So um, I'd recommend that if people have questions about this, you raise it with your doctor. There's a specific test that can be done. There are two tests. One is called a sleep study, which measures your airflow when you're sleeping at night. The other one is a nocturnal oximetry that measures your pulse ox continuously while you're asleep and records that pulse ox. So it can then be looked at by a specialist to see if you need oxygen at night or whether you might need to go to have a sleep study done instead. And the sleep studies used to be done in labs, but now they're very often done in um, at home, a home sleep test. And so, you know, those are things that you really should bring up with your with your provider so that you're getting the best care possible to give you the, the best likelihood of a long life and a quality life, a life full of doing all the things that you wanna do.